I think there's there's a very valid concern amongst uh, the Syrian population that uh, that extremist elements like ISIS, if if not ISIS itself, but also like ISIS, that all of these uh, people could come to come to the surface. Because the problem with um, the fall of a regime like Assad's is that it's really been hollowed out, um, you know, but by what's the events of the last, you know, decade and a half. And I think one analogy might be uh, Libya, that really the uh, institutions of the state there were almost non-existent by the time that Gaddafi fell and, and that allowed a free for all. So um, there's plenty to be concerned about. I think probably for an awful lot of our listeners, most of whom are based in, in the US and the UK, um, although, of course, globally as well, that IS has been maybe a bit under the radar in, in recent years for many of us. Yeah. Within Syria and just generally across the Middle East, how, how much does IS still exist and, and kind of in what form? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. So obviously when um, ISIS, Islamic State, IS there's a variety of things you can call them uh when they lost their caliphate they lost that sort of territorial control that they had in syria that was really critical um to their uh survival as an organization because it allowed them to um you know raise taxes uh take control um of of a whole area it just it, it helped sustain them as an organization so they haven't existed in that form since they lost uh that territory they do exist. Um, I mean, we've seen some activity in the last couple of days in reaction to what's happened already. Uh, some uh, there was a report yesterday from the Syrian Observatory, Observatory for Human Rights that uh, 54 fleeing Syrian soldiers have been uh, captured and executed by IS. Uh, there is also been talk about of the uh, ISIS, the black flag that we all remember so well, um, being uh, being raised and taken through Christian neighbourhoods in places like Homs. So there is some uh, clearly some attempt by these remnants to um, remind people uh, during this period of chaos uh, after you know the fall of Assad that they are still there. Um, and I think that the other form in which they exist, I mean, that they're, they're quite uh, quite prevalent in uh, Afghanistan, which is a bit of a problem for the West and for, and indeed for the Taliban. They've set themselves up against the Taliban there um, and they have carried out quite a lot of um, quite brutal attacks. And obviously there isn't really a you know there's no western presence there anymore to take them on the other place where they are um prevalent in one form is in these camps that uh, are in the kurdish areas of uh syria so they're in detention in those areas um you, you've got essentially two camps you've got one for the fighters the isis fighters who were detained by the kurds there um both foreigners and Syrians. And there's also the camp where the family members uh, are, most famously Shamima Begum. Um, the, some of the uh, countries involved in the fight against ISIS, like the US, have been very keen for countries to take back those foreign fighters and have said that this is too unstable a situation uh, for them to remain in. And, and Britain is one of those countries that has refused to take back either the families uh, or the fighters. Um, and so there's a great number of those people still there. And they could be, I think they, it, it's pretty critical what happens uh, in those camps and what happens to those camps, especially because they're run by Kurds who uh, Turkey um, are, are taking the fight to as we speak. And uh, so, you know, if, 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 if the Kurds get sort of run out of town, who, who is going to take... Um, who's going to take uh, hold of these prisoners. Uh, the other uh, place that, of course, these uh, some of these ISIS guys uh, exist or are present, uh, ironically, is in the prison which, uh, in Damascus, which we've seen, um, you know, prisoners pouring out of, released by, uh, by the rebels who've taken it over. Um, now, some of those people will be ISIS fighters. Uh, there's a, a, a great number of 
entirely innocent people who were there because of their opposition to the Assad regime. Uh, but there are also some pretty unsavory characters. And I think it's worth remembering that one of the reasons that Syria became um, such an incubator for uh, ISIS was that Assad emptied the jails of a lot of the extremists back in 2011 in an attempt to discredit the uprising against him, to associate it with these extremist jihadists. Um, so there's quite a cocktail there. Uh, I think a lot depends on, you know, what happens in Syria and, and how the situation there could be stabilized. Uh, it, indeed, can it be stabilized? Uh, I think it's just very uncertain. How much of a concern is IS and a, and a potential rise in Syria, both to the people of Syria, the, the wide population, the broad sort of type of population that, that they have in Syria, but also to, I guess, the hopes and dreams that perhaps the, the rest of the world and the West in particular are sort of trying to put upon Syria in this, well, I guess it's being seen as a moment of opportunity. Well, it is a moment of opportunity. And, you know, the, the, I mean, despite all the, you know, unknowns and known unknowns and all the you know instability that that there is there um the fall of assad is a good thing it has it is being celebrated very broadly amongst uh the syrian people and it's a i mean it's a very very diverse country in terms of all the different you know religious and ethnic minorities there it's by no means that you know a, uh, a monolithic uh population there um in terms of what I mean, the ISIS was never popular in Syria itself. Um, I mean, its relationship to HTS, who've taken you know taken power in the in the interim, is an interesting one. They started off as you know partners and fell out very badly, mostly over the violent extremes that ISIS took. Uh, you know that their, their their dream of a caliphate to. Um, so I, I think that yeah, I think there's there's very valid concern amongst uh, the Syrian population that uh, that extremist elements like ISIS, if if not ISIS itself, but also like ISIS, that all of these uh, people could come to come to the surface because the problem with um, the fall of a regime like Assad's is that it's really been hollowed out, um, you know, but by what's the events of the last, you know, decade and a half. And I think one analogy might be uh, Libya, that really the uh, institutions of the state there were almost non-existent by the time that Gaddafi fell and, and that allowed a free for all. So um, there's plenty to be concerned about. Given that, I mean, HTS, to, to, to those of us that have been reading, you know, from the outside for the, the course of the last week, looks like the powerful force in Syria right now. Why would this be a moment of opportunity for IS? Isn't isn't HTS, I don't know quite what the phrase is, you know, it's almost like, um, you know, possession is nine tenths of the law somehow. Um, so, so why would IS suddenly have the opportunity? And should we not be focusing more on HTS and what they may or may not be able to provide the Syrian people? Well, we definitely should be focusing on that. I mean, I think it's interesting that they've made emollient noises about sort of uh, plurality and democracy and representing everyone. Um, Jelani has taken off his uh, Islamic headgear uh, to when, when he made this address on TV. But uh, I, I heard an interesting report this morning from Jeremy Bowen, um, who'd arrived in Damascus and said that the lobby of the hotel stank of alcohol because uh, the HDS guys were going around smashing it all and getting rid of it. So I think that's one, uh, you know, they, they, they are an Islamist uh, government uh, how far they take that uh you know remains to be seen uh i think that one of the problems uh and one of what well, one of the things that led to isis taking over in the way that they did in that area the caliphate uh in both um Iraq and in Syria is, you know, there's vast areas of the uh, of the country where they can operate without actually having to have territorial control. So, you know, the, this massive, uh, there's a massive eastern desert uh, all the way to the Iraqi border. And it's those kind of ungoverned and ungovernable um, spaces that ISIS could take advantage of. I, I, I mean, 
you know, these are extremists. I, I, they, they are, they're as, as extreme as an extremist group that we've ever seen in, in the world. So um, they are, you know, the, these are sort of apocalyptic jihadis. They, they, they exist to um, sow chaos and to uh, sort of achieve their um, <laughs> non-earthly aims. I, I think it's just, uh, I, I think that all situations of instability when uh, it's not pinned down, we don't know for sure how uh, in control of things HTS are, um, are, are opportunities for groups like this to make a recurrent a resurgence. You've already mentioned these these 54 government soldiers that, that were executed yeah. by jihadists in the Homs Desert. Um, I'm wondering whether whether you think, had it been any other group other than IS who, who had caught them, do you think that they would have been handled differently? I, I guess what I'm asking is, are we, is it too early to know the type of people that we're dealing with, whoever ends up sort of rising up in Syria? I think potentially yes, because I think HTS have tried to uh, at least use the language of reconciliation. So they've said there will be amnesties for people who were involved in the in the regime. Um, so, but ISIS wouldn't do that, and and uh, government soldiers were always uh, a particular uh, target for for ISIS. I mean, they quite often. Um, would because because quite a lot of those soldiers they were predominantly uh, Shia, not Sunni, and ISIS are, are, are a Sunni group, um, and and the Syrian armed forces were dominated by Shia, so they often used to um, execute them on camera in one of these very like you know theatrically gory uh, sort of propaganda videos that they would make. Um, so yeah, Syrian soldiers were a particular. Um, it, it, it was always to send a message. Uh, I, I think that at the moment, um, HTS are ha they they haven't shown any inclination to behave like that at the moment. So you know, I think best case scenario is that uh, there is some sort of reconciliation. All right, and um, just for time purposes, let's just ask you the one more then. Um, how much do you think the potential rise of IS, you briefly talked about this, but I just want to go into a bit more detail, um, be be down to the West's sort of behaviour over the last 10 years, this refusal to repatriate their citizens to face terror trials, which you write about, you know, the, America in particular was, was frustrated with its, with its allies that they didn't do that. Yeah, I mean, you don't leave a bunch of people, you know, battle hardened people with a grievance sitting in a desert in an ungoverned space, um, especially when you've got um, an unreliable NATO ally like Turkey coming for the people who are holding them a prisoner. I think it, I personally always thought it was um, incredibly irresponsible of countries not to repatriate uh, people from that area. For this very reason, it, I mean, this isn't, uh, you know, all the warnings about why it needed to happen uh, are, are are what we're thinking about now. What we're discussing now is that, you know, this was the, the fall of Assad was always going to happen at some point, and there was always going to be a power vacuum, and we were going to find ourselves here, and and so now we are.